Hello and welcome back everybody, I'm Rapa Pavarian and this is Canada yet again. This is the Canada AAR, we already had one episode. I'm recording this at in the evening of the last episode, so I wasn't able to see your comments yet, but I will look at them and will then be ready with them in the third episode that will be coming out tomorrow. We already had a really good start. We witnessed basically a Canada that was just Upper Canada, that was uh, just one state, not even an entire state region, and yet was the richest, the highest standard of living location in any given location, in any given state within the British market and that is very impressive it was very fast it happened uh, without a doubt quite quickly and the IG and this was I think the most important the most interesting part that we saw in yesterday's episode the interest gra uh, interest group cloud distribution changed massively truly massively by changing laws by having everybody work in a different section and that sort of stuff today we will be seeing the impact of all of this being the richest province the richest location in any given uh, state you know of course in the entire British market will have some Certain situations happen, something will take place, and that something will be a huge, huge migration wave. You're going to see that. Um, I would also like to talk about market access, although I'm not certain whether we are going to be doing this in this video or in the one tomorrow. But hey, we'll see where we are in... I can't quite remember, right? Where we are when it comes to the AAR, what will be featured in here. Now, let's just do it. Big recap, last time we played as Upper Canada, we confederated with Quebec and the HPC, leaving us geographically large. We made a lot, of a lot of money from coal, but the market is no longer as hungry for the black gold as it once was, and we've had to start diversifying. Explosives seem to be a promising industry. Incorporating the HPC has left us in a bit of a mess. We have a bureaucracy shortage, and the budget is in, in an extreme deficit. I need to investigate this and address the causes. Looks like there is a university in Saskatchewan. As cool as this is, I don't think we can really support that right now shutting it down. It costs a lot of money. I would assume that uh, in Saskatchewan you don't really have the population or the amount of population to fill this university, meaning there's a lot of money you're paying for nothing and maybe they don't even have the education to actually take, you know, take those jobs. We also really do not need naval bases. Uh, that naval bases, if you remember, they produce the ships that can be used or rather, no, actually, do they produce the ships or are they where an admiral is basically pulling the flotillas from. Either way, he doesn't want to have a navy. That's as simple as it is, right? Although our bureaucracy shortage is as small, it results in more than 10% tax waste. We need to address this as soon as possible. Yes, close the university, send the children to the coal mines. On the topic of coal mines, we actually have more capacity for them now in Ontario. Ontario was a split state, with the other part being owned by the HPC. We can now expand up to level 18 in Ontario, and that makes this huge. Now, I will say, people brought this up, I, I don't disagree at all. Does Ontario have coal? The overwhelming answer appears to be no. <laughs> there never appears to have been a coal mining operation in Ontario. That should be addressed, but I mean, you can build other mines, you know, if you are playing as Canada's Upper Canada and then achieve something there. Uh, I think these sort of things, if you've ever been there for a launch, you know, for a release map, um, I don't think you should calculate in too much in terms of accuracy. They do listen, don't get me wrong here, but it's such a mammoth project that they will get stuff wrong. And you should expect that much as it is here wrong in this version, right? Like, likewise, we have also more capacity for iron in Quebec that is, of course, necessary for the further supply chain to build, for example, explosives and so on. Removing expensive buildings has mostly solved the budgetary crisis, but I've also had to reduce government wages to normal levels. Many of the luxuries of playing OPM Ontario are no longer viable as we have a larger and poorer population to deal with. Of course, only one state, and that is Ontario, is massively, massively rich. The rest is very much in the normal situation. Situation. One new positive thing, the trade unions are becoming ever more relevant and they approve of our government, though they're not part of it. Their approval gives us 10% throughput in our manufacturing industry, so this is one of the bonuses that they apply if they like you. Yeah, what particular reasons make the trade unions like the government? They like our set of laws, such as our republican form of government and the right of assembly. <sighs> this one is so weird to me. Um, Gameplay-wise, without a doubt, it functions as a, a republic somewhat, but it very much isn't. Canada, to this day, is not a republic. You have a governor that is sent by, or governor general, I believe, right? That is sent by the queen. Not that the governor does much, right? We don't need to talk about the constitutional implications of modern, uh, you know, monarchy, uh, monarchy, uh, <laughs> mod modern monarchy structures within Canada. We don't need to debate that here, but what I'm saying is that's not a republic. So... I also think that there is an issue, and I don't think this is just something that happened in this playthrough. I think Canada and Upper Canada, by default in Victoria 3, will appear as a republic. Is that odd? Yes. Um, 
Can it be fixed? I mean, we're gonna see this further down. Uh, maybe not here, actually, I'm not sure. Maybe it's in the intermission section, but... If you are Great Britain, and Canada actually went Republican, you couldn't intervene. I have noticed, and I think this is noticeable both in the German Confederation, in the sense that it doesn't exist, but also in the Commonwealth and all of the implications that come with it, I've noticed that the relationship that you necessarily have from have from being an ideological vassal of someone is completely underrepresented in Victoria 3. The German Confederation doesn't exist. The Commonwealth itself doesn't exist. The League of Nations obviously can't exist. Supranational organizations as a whole are not in the game. And this leads to you being able to be communist while still being a dominion of Great Britain. I think this is, for me personally, and I have had my fair share of complaints, or rather, you know, worries, this, for me personally, definitely is slowly but steadily becoming the thing that I need, that I want to see altered. Be that before or after launch, listen, hey, it's a it's a limit. You, you have a, a, a limited amount of time, right? You can't do everything, and that is completely obvious to me. I've, I've talked to so many developers, I understand that, but I will say, that's kind of odd. You're not a republic. I, I have to tell you, Canada, you're not a republic. <laughs> My apologies, right? So, yeah, basically, I'm hoping that we are seeing changes here because this has a huge, huge impact on how immersed I am in general. Our population is now 2 million, remember this number, with GDP rising to almost 8 million pounds. Due to discrimination against the First Nations, Nunavut and Manitoba have issues with turmoil. Uh, remember, we got rid of the police, which suppresses turmoil, meaning now there is just turmoil, uh, whatever that means. We ought to address this. Thankfully, I'm already in the process of researching egalitarianism to unlock more progressive laws. Maybe getting rid of the police was a bad idea. In this playthrough, I am aiming for a lighter touch. We're angry. Uh, they are angry for good reason, because they are discriminated against, of course, and he wants to change this. Are there any reasons in particular for the immigration spike to Ontario? Well, we've been encouraging immigration to Ontario for the whole game. With its very high standard of living, it is the most attractive state in the entire British market. There's something making the turmoil worse. The petite bourgeoisie despises our government's policies and their xenophobia has been activated. It sounds like a negative trait if somebody hates you. This increases the number of radicals from discrimination. So this, in my opinion, is not the optimal way, but it is a pretty good way of emulating that it's not necessarily the state that is suppressing somebody but rather it's also a social factor. Uh, think for example, I mean, think about anybody that is being discriminated against in any given society. People will treat them differently. That's the way it is. Uh, that needs to be approached some to some degree, but it has to be pointed out that this isn't state discrimination. When you look at, for example, and I mean, they did move it towards state discrimination, but when you look at the post-Civil War South, you will see that there were plenty of citizens down there that were discriminating against fellow citizens. The state itself, although they did do that with the Jim Crow laws later on, right? But the state itself did not say, we will discriminate against you. They did the very opposite. And then the states themselves instituted it on a statewide level, which is state discrimination. But where I'm coming from is primarily that an interest group discriminating against somebody, in this case, the petite, petite bourgeoisie is very much xenophobic and that activates and makes it worse because you don't only have state discrimination, you have social discrimination as well. Is it the optimal way? I don't think so. I think you could have a in general, lateral relationships between certain pops or between certain interest groups that then impacts members of those interest groups. I think that could be possible, but this is something that impacts you as a whole. And I mean, at the end of the day, it works, right? So very much not against this solution to have this sort of inter or in internal societal discrimination going on. Standard of living in Ontario remains very high, but it's been on the decline since the end of the coal boom. So now we are looking at the aftermath. Look at the most important, the strongest, the richest province in an entire market, look at their demand, their product, all of a sudden no longer being worth that much because some other person has started mining coal as well, and you have something that can, without a doubt, result in revolution. This is the stuff that I want. I think I brought it up in the, uh, in the earlier video, but it's very important for me that we don't just get the highs of saying, I played the market, I got it, boom, boom, boom. No, no, no. I want to st uh, see stuff like the Weavers of Silesia. If you don't know what that is, after industrialization started, there were weaving machines, made it every made everything easier. And in Silesia, where they still did it in a manufacturing process, so, you know, manually, they started rebelling because they were going hungry. They had a famine. They were in a desolate position. That is the downfall of the industry. The reaction, of course, of the Prussians, I mean, as the Prussians do, was to send in the army. That is exactly what this system must be able to emulate. And the player can go against that, but I'll be honest with you, man. Sometimes it's just fun 
to see the development of social shifts, right? Ontario can be saved here. The player can intervene, can change the market prices, can implement other factories, in implement other sources of income and of, you know, property and uh, prosperity. But the player could also choose not to do that. This is what I want. So this makes me very, very happy to see that, yes, we had this huge impact and now we're massive, but being massive means that they have more expectations and if we fall, we will fall deeper. I love that. Uh, which pops support the petite bourgeoisie, so the xenophobia, shopkeepers mainly, and clerks. Shopkeepers, remember, is one with the very standard uh, production methods. They're basically the burgers, they're basically the standard citizens that are investing the beginning of the bourgeoisie, I mean, as the name says, right? And to get rid of them, you want to industrialize because that produces uh, well, capitalists, and that is exactly the people that are in the industrialists, maybe in, in the intelligentsia, but the shopkeepers themselves are the petite bourgeoisie, they're fighting for their rights against the old order, against the monarchy, but they're not exactly liberal to any degree. Um, out of the 2 million, how many are native people? About 200,000, 10% of the population. The bureaucracy shortage is over, but with our expanding institutions, growing population and need to build quickly, we need more than an absence of a deficit. Building more administrations to give us a healthy surplus. And with a budgetary crisis near uh, largely resolved, I'm resuming the expansion of coal mines in Ontario, as well as the logging camps in Quebec. Oh, I should also check out the potentials, uh, potentials of my new states. Manitoba mostly is wood, nothing special here. Nunavut is Nunavut, yep, okay, that makes sense. Northwest territories have a bit of iron, and Saskatchewan already has some food industries and the logging camp. I'm actually expanding government administration here as well. It also has the potential for 15 levels of coal mines. This section is interesting to me. I don't think there's too much we can actually gauge from that, but uh, Wiz did say at some point, but Wiz did say that when this topic came up, administrative buildings, that you could theoretically, to administrate your entire world-spanning empire, you could have all of your administrative buildings in London or in uh, Ontario, in you know pa uh, Paris, and, Paris and so on. The fact that he's building something in the middle of nowhere in Saskatchewan could be sort of like a job program, right? But it could also be a new maybe territory location based requirement there i would be interested in that but who knows uh, it has also the potential for 15 levels of coal mines right alberta though even better more coal more sulfur more wood they do also have oil in alberta and finally well it's not discovered yet and finally the yukon territory has a lot a little wood and iron we're getting close to maxing out our healthcare institution investment we need more bureaucracy to complete it though Updating our production methods in the food industries we inherited. They're mildly profitable with canneries and sweeteners. You're also going to start using explosives in the iron mines. Price of iron is increasing, making it more profitable, maybe making it so that the standard of living in Ontario can be held up high. Blasting in the sulfur mines as well. The downside of these explosives is that it increases the mortality of the people employed there. Mining is dangerous work, meaning that the pops will grow slower, but that doesn't matter if the standard of living stays up, because that means... That's right, that migration will occur, and migration will occur. We now have egalitarianism. We've begun enacting multiculturalism, which was locked behind egalitarianism. The petite bourgeoisie and Anglican church absolutely hate this. They are threatening to start a revolution and overthrow the government. Despite being very angry, they are not actually very popular. I don't think they'll be able to pull it off. Think about it. Let's visualize why they're not popular, why they're not powerful. The Anglican church is in a position where basically the laws against it were enacted. There may be pops that want to be a part of the Anglican Church that would directly and naturally drift towards them, but there are no longer any schools that are religiously led, which makes it so that you have less of an impact. This is just a fact. They also made it so that they are no longer in government and that they removed most of the people that directly go give the power to the Anglican Church, which are the landowners, making it so that they, you know, of course, get some property or rather some uh, uh, benefits out of it, out of the church, but also out of being saved, religiously speaking. These people are no longer there. The petite bourgeoisie, made up of clerks and shopkeepers, clerks certainly will still be there, but the shopkeepers have been substituted out in favor of capitalists. This is why they're not powerful. There's nothing scripted here. There's nothing pre-generated. This is entirely the industrialized shift that he has done. And I truly love that. So that is really cool to see, quite frankly, that they want to rebel, but they can't because he has weakened them enough. You don't see that too often. I'm going to research pharmaceuticals next. A lot of people work in the mines, so reduction to mortality seems valuable. Do we have an army to deal with the, at least the internal problems? I do not. So no army, no police. And then the Irish arrive. Look at that. They have come to Quebec. The governor of the colony is William Leon uh, Leon Mackenzie. Apparently a famous figure in Canadian history. You know what? Let me... Oh, a famous person. So he was the mayor of York, then renamed to Toronto. 
and it appears that he was a huge part of the rebellions in 1837. Uh, so, well, we have a true rebel right here, don't we? Uh, that is Mr. McKenzie, apparently a famous person. I'm kicking the industrialists out of the government, so that is the capitalists, which are likely to have a lot of clout. They have served their purpose, but we don't need them anymore. The intelligentsia's radical party rules alone. I don't know what that means. I, I thought about this. I don't know what that means. Radicals, I understood it, are people that are against the state. Radical party just sounds like a reform party. Oh, wait a minute. Parties. Oh my god, wait a minute. So the intelligentsia formed a party called the Radical Party, which currently, potentially, exclusively contains the intelligentsia? How would we go about getting somebody to join that party? How do you... S oh my god, is that... That would be so cool. Listen, this is purely conjecture. I want to make that clear as well. But could it be that an interest group can maybe be encouraged to found a party? And then if somebody aligns with the interest group, they can join that party and will be stronger in elections because of it. Of course, it's a block. You know, they don't vote each other out. No, they benefit from one another. Potentially making it so that... Oh, wow. I didn't realize this, but this is just actually the party system. Their party is just called Radical Party. Whether there's somebody in it, I don't know, but the Intelligentsia has founded it. That's pretty cool. I am r so curious how party mechanics actually work. So, so curious. Whether they do anything meaningful or whether they're just sort of like on top. But I can imagine so many cool different ways of implementing parties that make it interesting. Very excited to see that. Anyway, let's continue. The population is growing at an alarming rate. I'm really struggling to keep up with the bureaucracy cost. I might have to scale back on institutions. For now, I'm taking on more deficit to build administrations in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Due to oh, and look at that. Yeah, he is building administrations in individual states. I have to assume that this already they already changed how administrations worked, right? Why else would he be building it there? Maybe they are unemployed, but... Why else would he be building it there? Due to a massive amount of migration to Canada, the population is approaching 3 million. Up here, I believe we were talking about 2 million, right? Uh, where, where were we here? 2 million, yeah, wow. And now we are at 3 million. I could cancel the migration decree, but I, the migration isn't just affecting Ontario anymore. It's all of Canada. Do you need and not need ships to stay connected to the larger British market? Britain provides the ships. And this brings me to something I want to talk about. It will, it will take some time, okay? But people brought this up. And I think this is a niche case. And I mean this not as dismissive and not in a dismissive way. I mean this in a way where I think the developers may have looked at it and said, we don't need to worry about that too much initially. But hear me out here. When you are part of a market, your trade depends on whether you can reach the market capital. In this case, London. If I cut you off, for example, by destroying the port that connects you to London and leaving you with zero ports that could connect you, right? If I cut you off, every single state that is now cut off will not be able to trade with anybody in the market and they can only use their own resources. What does that mean? This means that despite somebody living in Quebec and me in Ontario, right next to them, having exactly what they need, they can't get it to me because neither of us has access to the market. There was a... Uh, th this is an interesting topic, an interesting debate that happened uh, today. I want to, of course, bring that in immediately. That basically was had in the Victoria 3 Discord. I recommend checking it out, of course. Again, very... Uh, a lot of good debate there. And I think it is a niche case that you would cut off somebody like that. It's a warfare case, right? In which case, hey, yes, it shows the consequences of warfare. But realistically speaking, Quebec would still be, be, be trading with Ontario. A uh, suggestion that people made, and I think the devs said they tried this and it didn't work, but a suggestion that people made was effectively to say, why don't you have regional market capitals? So, for example, Canada could have Canada, right? And if Canada's market is cut off from London, then Canada can at least still trade with itself. If Canada reconnects to London, Hey, all of a sudden, you will just normally interact with the London market capital, completely ignoring Canada. That is something that I found interesting. Whether it would work, I don't know. But right now, I mean, the, the funny example went, basically, if I somehow got Russia to be a vassal that includes market, you know, uh, uh, no longer being independent on your market, if they suddenly or somehow became a market of, for example, Luxembourg, all of Russia would starve, migrate away, go bankrupt, be completely screwed. The reason for that is, if they can't access Luxembourg, 
They can't trade with anybody. Moscow might be very much connected to St. Petersburg, but they cannot trade. And that is something that I found quite funny. Because I definitely think that can be an exploit. I definitely think... I uh, Listen, whenever I get my hands on this game, I'm going to try that. Believe me. But what I'm saying is that there's a risk here that could be mitigated if, for example, Moscow, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, if, uh, you know, the uh, Siberian parts of Russia, if they all had their own market capitals that activate if they are de uh, disconnected from the actual market capital. Either way, let's move on. Just uh, food for thought, I think. Do the people who immigrate eventually become Canadian? We're not really assimilating people, at least not at any appreciable rate. So the answer is yes, but we're not really focusing on that. How much of Canada do you own now? Most of it geographically. We're missing the Maritimes and British Columbia. There's also the Iron Confederacy, so these are Native Americans. But that is a decentralized nation, meaning unplayable, unrecognized and colonizable. Uh, our health system is at maximum investment in the game. The year is 1846. Ten years in has done a lot. I mean, hey, this is a definitely a bit of a min-max playthrough, I think. The Iron Confederacy needs to learn our peaceful ways by force. We might have to do that. There's no way to peacefully annex them, right? No, because it's colonization. Uh, the PB, so the Petite Bourgeoisie, has decided they don't like Australians now. I love this. This is huge. This is huge to me. Interest groups are able to say we do not like certain ethnicities, cultures, whatever. Religions. What if you extend this? So they can like and dislike laws. Maybe they can like and dislike, you know, uh, cultures and ethnicities and religions. Maybe they can like and dislike certain goods. Hey, we don't like opium. We're the church. We don't like it. Whatever, right? What if they could also like or dislike certain tags? What if you declare a war against a tag that they dislike? You know, I don't know, the Erbfeindschaft, for example, between France and Germany and the petite bourgeoisie says we hate France. You declare a war, you get... 15% of our approval, something like that. Wouldn't that be great? All of a sudden, the IGs would have a big impact on your foreign policy. What if certain IGs say, okay, listen, we like that country. We need to be friends. We want to have a trade agreement. That sort of stuff. I would absolutely love that. Seriously, that would be so, so good. Because right now, at least from what we know, at least from what we have heard, it doesn't seem like IGs have a big, big impact on you know diplo uh, diplomacy. For example, they don't seem to have any stakes when it comes to uh, the uh, the diplomatic place. Like, they don't say you demanding land is good, but you want to wanting to vassalize them is bad because it's an overreach. Those people did exist, by the way, in Great Britain. They were called Little Englanders, and they basically said Canada, listen, buddy, we love you, but we don't want you as a, as a vassal because you're kind of annoying and we're busy and we're cooler than you. We can't hang out anymore. That sort of stuff should be represented as well, in my opinion, whether they support the government or not. Maybe it is. We don't know. Their bigotry knows no bounds. The petite bourgeoisie is unfortunately just a fact of life for now. This is getting out of hand. The Flemish uh, are arriving in Ontario. You know what? This is fine. Franco-Canadians are leaving to Mexico. Why is that fine? That is fine because the Franco-Canadians are voting for the church. The Franco-Canadians are Catholic. And they're very unhappy about being in an Anglo-Canadian dominated country. I wish them well in Mexico. We have, a, uh, we have about enough bureaucracy. This frees up some of the budget to start developing industry in the more rural states. We'll begin with coal mines in Alberta. We have pharmaceuticals. Our research central banking next. Ontario will actually need a railway shortly. I'll queue one up. So there is now enough, uh, you know, uh, stuff coming in and going out of Ontario that it actually needs a railway. Remember, he said he doesn't, doesn't need it, but now after 10 years, he definitely does. This is getting towards public health care, right? I think that'll be a part of the later phase of reforms that will involve getting the trade unions into government. 3.5 million people live in Canada now. Migration is out of control. Is it extreme? Absolutely. Is this the richest territory anywhere in the empire? Yeah, sure. Maybe it should be a bit more normalized that the standard of living isn't that extreme, but listen, this is the obvious result. You are rich. Everybody back home here is like, yeah, we can live here in Manchester. <laughs> Manchester, my God. Or I could live in Toronto. You know, they will move to Toronto. How is multiculturalism in terms of getting passed? We have a really good chance to pass it in a month. And we did it. All are welcome in Canada, no matter their in uh, ethnicity or creed. Are the uh, petite bourgeoisie still racist? Yes, they've started a movement to enact racial segregation. Jesus. I'm cancelling the migration decree for Ontario. Population is up to 3.5 million and I can't keep up with the growth. I'm a victim of my own success. Here is uh, DJ Khaled. Literacy is down to 47% after all this migration and incorporation of new states. There's a lot of ed educational work to be done. Alright, Nuba migration is also coming. Maybe you need migration control laws. I want migration, but this is a lot at once. 
I think I need to stop passing laws and let the petite bourgeoisie and church chill out. The petite bourgeoisie is still mad about my abolition of the police. First Coleman in Alberta has opened and Mackenzie defended his government in the election. Do government parties run together? I doubt it, right? I'm so curious how uh, elections work in general. Victoria 2 was super cool and also super meaningless. But the idea of it was really neat. Uh, who knows? We, we don't know anything. I can't really have conjecture. First coal mine in Alberta. Waiting on full employment to judge whether to go all in on this industry. Yep, it's profitable. What ideology is Mackenzie? Mackenzie is a radical. So the radical party, which contains the intelligentsia, is likely led by Mackenzie. What does it mean to be radical? I don't know. I, I have no idea. Do you know? Did I miss some piece of information? I, I have no idea. I'm going to try something new in Quebec, now that we've built as many logging camps as we can. What I can say about Radical is, uh, it seems like a doubling up. I'm not saying Radical isn't the period appropriate term for some sort of ideology, but what I am saying is that it definitely doubles, and that's not good. We have Radicals that are disloyal to the state, and then we have Radicals that have this ideology, and they mean different things, right? So, how about that? I, I, I don't know. I wish they, they used different terms. I will build a motor industry. I've looked at other motor industries in Britain, and they are very profitable. I'm happy. We, uh, I'm hoping we can replicate their success in Canada. Oh, there appears to have been a demographic shift that I was not aware of. Of the 3.7 million people in Canada, almost 1 million are Ashkenazi Jews. This makes 100% sense. And I mean this in the sense that if you had a country like Canada, which didn't exist in 1846 and wasn't about to exist for a long, long time, but if you had a country like Canada and you had a group of people discriminated basically everywhere and the Ashkenazi Jews primarily in this time period uh, could be found in Poland because of the very rich history of Poland. Um, you know, they, 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 there's a lot of history. Actually, I would like to, I'm going to link a video by uh, Sam Arano in the description. That is really, really, Sam Arano is one of the best content creators on YouTube. He does Jewish history and Poland has such a cool piece of history related to uh, the, the Jewish population. And they are suppressed because they are living in Poland. They're not Russian. They're not Prussian. They are not Austrian. Makes a lot of sense to me that they migrated. Again, if a country as liberal and multicultural as Canada had existed, which it did not, of course, everybody would go, right? If Canada says we take everybody, we love it, then you go. Are these the Polish immigrants? Mostly, but they are coming from all around Europe because, again, they're not, they're basically discriminated everywhere. The first Canadian railway runs from Toronto to Bytown. I connect Montreal to the railway line once I'm done with the motor industry. We should be able to annex Columbia District in a few months. This will actually give us Idaho and Oregon, since the US seems uninterested in those states. If the Americans ever ask, we'll give them up, though. It doesn't want to fight. Is the USA powerful? They seem to have lost their GP status, but they are still one of the strongest in the world. It appears that they weren't able to get taxes, and without taxes there's no man uh, manifest destiny. Without manifest destiny, there's no great power, you will say. Finnish migration to Ontario, look at that. Wow, these motor industries are very profitable indeed. I wonder if water tube boilers will increase profits. Nope, they will not. They increase input costs too much. Is this a bug, or is Canada a really good place to live in? Canada is honestly just a great place to live in. No discrimination, high standard of living. Exactly like I said. I like this. Is it a bit over the top? Maybe. I can't judge that. I'm not playing it. But what I will tell you is this effect should exactly be this. The magnitude of the effect, we can debate that. But the fact that he has a high standard of living, no discrimination, should lead to this exact outcome. The boilers require extra coal, labor, and tools. Also, this helps. Propagandists, plus 100% migration attraction. Since this interest group, I assume the intelligentsia, is powerful, their interest group traits have a plus 100%, and it is the intelligentsia indeed. All right, let's see what new chaos will result from annexing Columbia District. Annexing the Pacific Coast did very little, really. Not many people living there. We could actually form Canada if we colonize the Iron Confederacy. I'm bringing back Charles Beckwith of the Industrialists into government. He supports colonial exploitation. With the new coalition government, co uh, capitalists are heavily investing in our industries again. You know what this makes me think? Uh, we don't know how it works, but I think it might be good, and maybe that's already the case. If government legitimacy took a hit every time I exchange people from my government, and then it builds up over time. That way, I can exchange my government, but I can't do it endlessly. Maybe that's already the case. It might very well already be the case, but that would be cool, I think. Because otherwise, I can just brr, 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 switch back and forth, right? Obviously, they lose approval, but legitimacy, in my opinion, should already be tied to that. Uh, with a new coalition government, capitalists are heavily investing in our industries again. Well, you have to build an army to colonize the Iron Confederacy only if things go wrong, because that 
Colonization appears to just work unless they challenge you. They did point out in the Everything We Know So Far post by Liana, they did point out that uh, you need machine guns to defend your colonies should war break out. The decentralized country, if I recall this correctly from that post, will declare war if they feel threatened enough. And if they do, you have to basically defeat them as it's a normal frontline fight. Right. Um, British Columbia has potentials for many resources, but none in great abundance. Fair amount of coal in Washington, Oregon and Idaho are unexciting. And then Romanians going to Quebec. Good for them. I'm working towards my goal of connecting the oceans by rail, only a few states to go. Toronto, Quebec is up and running. What's the current population? 4.6 million. We were at 2 million at the start of this session. 4.6. It's crazy. It, it really is crazy. But then again, who knows how Europe is looking. What we do need to keep in mind, even if the balancing is off because the devs, as many of you pointed out in the last AR, the devs are speeding up how the AI acts so that you can see greater effects. But what I'm talking about is, even if this is a lot of migration, we don't know what's happening in Europe. Maybe Prussia turned out fascist. Oh wait, is Prussia, they already were. Uh, God, him tops my head. Uh, <laughs> listen, what I'm saying is, okay? Tops my head, tips my head. What I'm saying is, it could just be that in a playthrough, something went horribly wrong and then migration happens. Numbers, whether they are final or not, whether they look balanced or not, can severely depend on individual things that happen in individual countries. Maybe in a playthrough, Austria-Hungary decided to discriminate against Hungarians. You know how many people want to migrate to a completely liberal Canada? Many, right? Maybe one playthrough, they don't do anything against Hungarians and nobody migrates. These numbers doesn't play a role. You will see massive decreases and increases throughout your playthroughs once the game is out, I'm certain. Do the trains make profit or are they subsidized? They are capable of making profit, but ours need subsidized subsidies. Has the US already built a transcontinental railroad? They don't even own California, so no. Could your Canada possibly surpass the US in terms of population? That is very unlikely. Fair enough. Railway complete. The stroke released the trigger for a burst of sound which stretched the gamut of the air. The shouts of engineers and dynami dynamiters, of locomotive workers and explorers flanking the rails we were but a, a tuning up for a massed continental chorus. This reads like the end effect of a quest, which means journal system. Whatever that may be. Time to annex New Brunswick. We're now done with our confederations. All the Canadian colonies have been incorporated. What's preventing us from actually forming Canada is the Iron Confederacy. And I think it's time. I love this icon. This is such a good icon. It looks so nice. Uh, this will be our very first tier, uh, tier 3 tech. It's a big milestone. We're entering a new technological era and it just never ends. Ukrainian migration. Welcome to Quebec. We struck gold in the Yukon. This is super cool. Striking gold in the Yukon. It's not endless. You use it, then it's used up. But until it's used up, many, many people will go there. And afterwards, they got nothing. I love that. That's really cool. Trade unions are now the most powerful IG in the country. I think it'll be their time to shine soon. I'm slowing down industrial expansion a bit to grow my gold reserves. Do you made up your and have you made up your mind about adding the gold communist Canada? I don't think I'll go that far. We'll see about that. Even more gold discovered in Yukon. This is driving migration to the region. How's your progress on integrating the Iron Confederacy? I haven't managed to pass the required law yet. For the first time in many years, nobody is threatening to overthrow the government. We just got the law. The rate of colonization is very slow, however. Tools have become very expensive in the British market, which is harming many industries. Love this. Um, I really want to see that. If a market struggles, you as a minor nation can't change that much about it. That means you need to react. That's the sort of stuff that I want in my society simulator game. Am I sensing a good profit opportunity? You are. I'm building workshops in Manitoba as we speak. Also, how is the mother Britain doing? Britain is just generally existing. Wait, what is the year right now? 1850. So, not much happened in these four years, right? Because, hey, he was busy doing other stuff. GDP is at 20 million and population has risen to 7 million. Look at that. How many people are actually Franco and Anglo-Canadian? Only 600,000 people are Franco-Canadian. Anglo-Canadian is still the largest uh, cu culture, however, with 1.3 million people. That is far from a majority, though. Uh, the Jews are the second largest one, right? Ukrainians and Romanians have overtaken them, actually. Are there independence movements, like in Victoria too? Every culture is accepted. Nobody wants to become independent from Canada. This very much, to me, feels very similar. I think uh, that's the fair way of phrasing it to uh, the way CK3 does it. Most vassals that accept that your kingdom is fine, they will try to change it with claimants by claiming it themselves. But then there are some vassals that just say, nah, I, I just want to leave. I want to have my own kingdom. I want my culture to be independent. 
there seem to be these two allies, uh, allies. So one ally that says, hey, you are a part of our democratic sh system, of our system in general, you can just participate. And then one that says, make your own. And this seems to be exactly what that is. Nobody wants to make their own because they can all participate in Canada. And all right, farewell. Anglo-Canadians are going to Rio de Janeiro. Is Canada the most progressive country in the world? By far. I'm curious to what extent Britain is benefiting from your success. They are getting a whole lot of coal and wood and fairly cheap because otherwise nobody would have built this otherwise meaning that there is or would be less coal in the circum uh, in the circulation of the market not much happening at the moment colonization continues very slowly continuing to develop various industries mainly coal and wood just managed to expand the institution a bit which more than doubles the rate of colonization it's time for one final act of the Mackenzie government he's entered into a coalition with the trade unions to pass universal suffrage for men nobody cares about women's rights at the moment they don't have the tech and that sounds really weird, uh, the tech for feminism, but you do need to time gate it somewhere, right? Otherwise, you could have your utopia or dystopia or whatever in 1836 after a few revolutions, and that's obviously nonsense. So I kind of get it. You, you do need to time get it. But we already talked about how I don't believe the technology system to be the most innovative ever made. Uh, the industrialists are opposing the law. They have some support, but no radicalism whatsoever. There's a good chance we pass the law and the first try support is very high. Uh, what would it like to take to expand the franchise? You need feminism tech before people will start to care. Though earlier reformers will at least want to pre uh, prevent women from being considered property. I'm guessing that's the end of the AAR. We're still going, but not much to say for now. We'll probably wrap things up pretty soon though. Well, that's took a while. that took a while. Iron Confederacy has been fully integrated, which means... Canada. Looks nice, doesn't it? Looks really nice. And I think that's where I leave this AAR. He didn't leave it there. There are one intermission and two more parts, so <laughs> we have more videos. Might continue on my own time to wrap up the final goal of public health care, though. Flag. Look at that. It's a nice flag. Uh, I like this. I think this has a, a lot of potential. There is much, much more to come. But what we saw right here was the somewhat a downfall of the cost of living not large enough to cause a revolution but that is exactly what could cause a revolution the yukon has gold and all of a sudden we're in a dire situation we talked about the market access th theory behind it right the luxury a uh, luxembourg russia example i think there's a lot to consider let me know what you think in the comments and i will see you tomorrow with part number three until then later alligator